Hello everybody, welcome to part three of our series. Today we are going to talk about the business. The business of performing opera and singing professionally, both locally and internationally. I did get a lot of questions asking about um, things having to do with the business. And I kind of, as I've done with all the other videos so far, I kind of bundled them up into general subjects. And so the first one, and they're in alphabetical order, sorry. The first one is, um, just general advice. And for that, that's actually what I got the most questions about was just advice, advice for people when they're in school, advice for when you're out of school, advice for when you're already on the road, advice for all that good stuff. Auditions, I'm gonna talk a little bit about auditions, what's some things you can prepare for, what's, what are some things you can expect. Directors and coaches, management and agents, and finally, the unfairly last topic of rejection. <laughs> Since rejection is one of the first things we ever experience, it's so funny to put it at the end. But uh, let's start at the top. So advice. Um, when you're in school, even when you're not in school, but when, particularly when you're in school, those are the years that you should be building your best learning habits and your best vocal habits. Because really, what you do at those, in those formative years of your musical training are what are pretty much going to carry you through as a baseline your entire singing life unless you've developed a bunch of really bad ones and then you have to go and totally gear shift and change them. Ideally, if you've developed good habits in college and good habits in the conservatory, those things are gonna actually carry you over forever because that is gonna be one of the last times that you're gonna be in a completely safe little bubble where you can make mistakes, you can, you know, you have a teacher there every single week, you have a coach there all the time. That's gonna be one of the last times you can do that in a safe setting and make a lot of mistakes. So make your mistakes then. It's gonna be the best time for you to explore and try different repertoire and work on figuring out what technique works for you. But um, the danger of that time when you are very, very young is the temptation to try and think about, well, this is what I wanna sing 10 years from now logistically, so this is what I should start working on now. Um, whenever I go and teach uh, at universities or, or work with young artists, you know, I always kind of shudder a little bit when I see one of them bringing Wagner or when I see one of them bringing a very um, intense Verdi aria or something that I, even sometimes Mozart, things that I know, especially once I start hearing, I always am open and I, I'll listen to whatever any student will bring, but I always start listening and I start going, ooh, wow, okay, this person's trying to force their voice into that category, even though that may be where their voice is eventually headed, but at this time in school, it's not really the time to be necessarily working on that repertoire so intensely. The reason being, um, you know, when you're young, you can get away with more bad habits. You can get away with more messiness and sloppiness because you're young and you are um, resilient and your voice will bounce right back and you can get away with a lot more. You can push and it won't be as bad for you. You know, you can drink a lot and your voice will kind of be fine. You don't have to warm up as much. All those things are all fine and dandy when you're young. <laughs> but then when you start having to work out work in the field uh, and the years start to add up and your experience starts to add up, you're going to start going, whoa, wait a second, whoa, all these things that I've been doing when I was in college aren't working anymore. Oh my God. And that isn't to say that you have a vocal crisis, God forbid. But you're going to find out that, hmm, you're going to have to start making some changes. So I'm always of the belief that basic is best. When you're in college and when you're in conservatory, you should absolutely look at arias. You should absolutely look at art song. You should absolutely look at music like at Mozart and Handel and things like that. But you should do it from a much more, uh, you shouldn't be in such a rush and you should spend a lot more time vocalizing. When I was taking voice lessons with my teacher when I was a young artist, Bill Schumann was my teacher. He still is my teacher, one of them, uh, in New York. And we would go to our voice lesson and vocalize Vocalize, vocalize, exercises, exercises, exercises for like 40 to 45 minutes before I even touch an aria. And then for the last 15 minutes of the, of the lesson, I would sing an aria. And then that was it. That was the end of the lesson. And I remember talking to my friends about this and they would be like, that's so strange. You know, I, I don't understand. I, I go to my lessons with him and all we do is vocalize, you know, and people would be kind of uncomfortable. And I'm like, that's the voice lesson. <laughs> That's the voice lesson. The voice lesson is vocalizing, is exercising. That's exactly that's what instrumentalists do. That's what instr when instrumentalists practice, they practice scales, they practice arpeggios, they practice etudes. Singers should be doing the exact same thing. So when you are practicing, when you're having your voice lesson, I know you want to just get to that aria and learn to sing that one phrase, but if you work on exercises that build the strength and build the particular skill that you are trying to execute, 
let's say it's something that's in the passaggio, you know, register shifts and things like that. There are more exercises available to work on that than any aria or any role. In fact, that's exactly where you should start. The Marchese books are really good. There's a million. I mean, look in your library, ask your teacher, but that's where the voice, the voice should be practiced like an instrument. Um, so that's what I think one of the things you can work on when you're in college. Another big thing you can try to invest as much of your time as possible into is learning your languages. You know, um, it's so much faster and so much easier to learn music when you can translate it quickly. When you don't have to look up every single word, you don't have to Google a translation, um, you will just have a much easier time. Your learning time will just be cut in half and you are, you'll feel much more at, in touch and at ease with your character. And then when you're in scenes with other characters and they're talking to you, you'll be able to react exactly when you're supposed to react because you'll know word for word what they're saying. Um, it's much better, I find when I do translations, I do not do poetic translations. Those don't work for me. I have to have literal word for word translation so that I can point to a word in a score. What does that mean? Well, this means beautiful. Well, it comes before the noun. Does the adjective come before the noun? Does the verb come at the end? That is super important for your interpretation. It will help you color your interpretation. It will help you understand your characters your characters differently because different languages have different personalities. And when you're singing in French and expressing yourself in French, it's another color if the, the voice is gonna sound a little different because the vowels are different and the text itself is gonna just make you feel differently, make you express differently. So the more you can get to learning your languages really, really well when you're young, when, you're, when your brain is nice and quick for that and you have time to work on that, please do that. You will find later it's so much of benefit. Obviously, it would be really great if you can start your healthy habits when you're in college. You know, if you're going around partying and you're eating junk food, I know it's not, it's hard because you don't have any money in college. Like I get that. I, I went through that too, but it was all I did when I went to college was gain weight. Uh, and then whenever I sang an audition or whenever I would sing, you know, even my voice lessons, you know, somebody would bring it up to me and say it was a bad thing and it would always freak me out. And so, um, it just made it worse. So if you can be aware of that with yourself and just have that be your little, one of the things you're working on when you're in college, don't let college be a time of total health detriment just because you're having fun and you're partying. You know, I, I was a very serious student when I was in school and yeah, I miss out on a lot of fun. I miss out on you know, getting invited to people's houses and staying out all night and going to football games and screaming. I, I missed out on that. I'm sorry. I put my dream first and, you know, I don't regret that. That doesn't mean that you can't have a great time and enjoy your young life. I just think if this is what you really, really want, and this is another big piece of advice, if this is what you really, really, really want more than anything in this world, it has to be number one for you because this business, and I'm going to say it a hundred percent with a hundred percent truth, this business is extremely difficult to get into and to stay in, uh, and to continue in a path full time in this business. It is extremely competitive. It is extremely cutthroat. Um, it will absolutely chew you up and spit you out and move on to the next person. If you don't have the foundation and the mental strength, uh, and the personal um, foundation to be able to deal with a lot of the difficulties that will come your way. It's not a question of if, it is a question of when, and it's a question of how much. Every single artist, no matter how successful, no matter how famous and beautiful and fantastic their career seems to be, no matter how great they sing and how beloved they are by their fans, every single performing artist has to deal with the struggles of the business uh, in one way, shape, or form. So you will not be exempt from that. So with that being said, um, I always tell people, you know, if this is not what you really want and you can't picture yourself doing anything else, or, or if you can picture yourself doing anything else, do something else. Because like I said, this is a big, big, difficult trek. Um, I also feel like, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a part-time career. I mean, a lot of people ask me about that. Well, you know, I want to have kids or I want to settle down. You know, I don't really want to travel so much. You know, can I still have a part-time career? Can I still have a career and balance my, my life, my home life, you know, as a wife or as a, as a, as a parent? Yes, you absolutely can. I mean, that's that I feel like that journey is absolutely one that a lot of people take. Some people join a chorus, a professional chorus, just so that they can have it be in one place all the time and earn a great salary and work in one opera house and not have to do the whole 
merry-go-round that the international people are doing. That's totally fine and totally respectable. And you might actually get a lot of joy and pleasure because you just get to make music and you don't have to deal with all the stress of having a solo career. Um, so that might be something that you'd consider doing, you know, um, there are definitely a lot of people who I know who sing concerts and get a lot of joy from that. They don't necessarily throw themselves into theater, you know, so, I mean, there are lots of different avenues that you can take and still be a performing artist. But the advice that I'm giving is where I'm coming from, which is a place of a professional traveling salesman, <laughs> a professional traveling international solo artist. There are a lot of people who, after they finish school, they kind of are like, okay, well now what? What's the next step, right? Um, most people will then either continue on and do another degree, or they'll join a young artist program somewhere, or they'll take some time off and do some auditions, and perhaps even start auditioning for agents, or they might join a fest, do a fest contract in Germany or in you know Europe. And every single avenue is totally legit. It really just depends on you. It depends on your level of development. It depends on your voice type. It depends on how, you know, who's heard you, you know, who knows you, who's invited you to do something, where you where you live, what, you know, what you have access to. Um, when I finished college, as I was finishing college and all throughout college, I sang a lot of voice competitions. Uh, and that's something that I definitely, definitely tell people to try and do as much as you can voice competitions because they are going to be a stepping stone to the beginnings of a career somewhere. Because that's where all of the uh, representatives from different companies, they come to competitions and they judge all over. It's like a little, you'll never know who you're gonna get. It's like a box of chocolates. You know, who's gonna show up at the competition this time in your region? Um, so preparing your audition package and your competition package is super important. And it's something you should definitely start doing already when you're in college. Uh, and look for arias that are contrasting. They always ask for contrasting styles, but it's more important that you do arias that are right for you. Don't just sing five arias that are completely like five different, completely different things, unless you can do that brilliantly in all five styles, marvelous. But in general, you should try and find things that suit your voice well. So when you prepare an audition package, a competition pa package, they're very similar. Let's, let's talk about them separately. Auditions, let's say you're auditioning for just a general audition for a young artist program or a general audition for maybe some managers or whoever. Auditions should show your strengths as best as possible. And they should show you in a way that is present, not completely neutral. Don't show up at an audition as a blank slate. Show up at an audition with some color already on your palette. You need to have a statement. You need to say something as an artist because auditions are a dime a dozen, especially if you are a lyric soprano, a lyric baritone, even a coloratura soprano. If you're a voice type that is common and we know who we are, hey, um, we are going to be heard. They're going to hear a hundred of other singers just like you who are going to come in and sing the exact same aria. So figure out how you're going to sing that exact same aria la causa, or or whatever it is, differently from the guy before you that just sang la causa. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like in auditions, you know, dress, everybody's saying, oh, you know, it's all about what you wear. And it is important to wear the right things. Um, it's frustrating, but it's something that I came across a lot when I was auditioning and stuff. I would always hear this advice later about, well, she wore this awful dress and so they couldn't see past the dress and they didn't like her voice. And I'm like, Really? Yeah, really. Invest, it doesn't mean invest in fancy clothing. It means invest in tailoring for your body type that serves you well and makes you look as secured and supported and beautiful as possible. And for gentlemen, that is the exact same thing. Look tailored, look sharp, look simple and sleek. Those things are always, always appreciated. If you show up looking sloppy, if you show up looking sweaty and looking, you know, messy and you haven't brushed your hair and you're not shaven and your shoes aren't shiny. I mean, those, I'm not saying you have to come in looking like the Prince of Wales, but you do need to come in looking like you put some effort into your appearance because your appearance is absolutely going to be judged in auditions and in competitions. So let's talk about competitions a little bit. Competitions are different because they're for money. They're for prizes. And we get into this mindset of so-and-so beat me and I didn't win because so-and-so sang, you know, better than me. Throw that out of your mind immediately. 
as early as you can. Do not take competitions as a gauge of your talent or as a gauge of your goodness or your potential at all. If you can get critiques from the judges, that's the most important thing you need to get from a competition. Whether you win money or not, it's great if you win money. It's awesome. Fabulous. You can buy a new score. You can buy a new dress. You can buy a plane ticket to go sing some more auditions, some more competitions. But you also need to sing things for your audition choices, for your, your music. You need to sing things that are going to show you off in a way that you do better than anything else. Like your five best arias, not necessarily your five smartest arias. Like when you're singing a general audition, you want to kind of show that you can do a little bit of everything. You know, you can sing in German, you can sing Reset, you know, you can sing Bel Canto, you can sing Coloratura, you can sing Legato. Fine. That's great in an audition. It's super important. In a competition, you need to find the arias that absolutely show that off. It's the most extreme way possible. So sometimes it's good to bring an aria that nobody else sings. So if you are a lyric baritone, and you would normally sing Ai Javinta La Causa, don't. Don't sing Ai Javinta La Causa. Sing something else. Find another lyric baritone aria. There's a hundred million. If Rossini is good for you, sing something with, with Rossini. Sing something risky. Because I always feel like competitions, we everybody kind of comes out and sings the same stuff. And sure, fine. Unless you can sing it a hundred times better than everybody else in front of you, it's going to be much harder for them to say, oh, well, that's the best one. Let's give him a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever. So... Find arias that really show, showcase you and the things that you do well and perform them. Give them a show. Give them confidence. Make choices. Commit to the choices that you make when you sing an audition. It's one of the things I find when people get on stage for a competition, they get very nervous and they're not sure how much they should move around because there's kind of people who move all around the stage the whole time and there's people who stand completely still. Try to be in the middle. <laughs> If it's natural for you and if it's appropriate to the aria, don't move just because you're, you feel like you should move. Move if it's appropriate to the aria, if it's appropriate to the moment and to the character. Um, try to tailor your movements to something that is specific and something that is authentic. If it looks unnatural, if it feels unnatural, it probably is unnatural. You know, I mean, Singing is unnatural as it is, you know, singing everything that we're saying is a little unnatural as it is, but there's no reason that you can't have a gesture or have, you know, a movement or a facial expression that doesn't add to your singing. It should add to your interpretation, not subtract from it. So if you're going to make a gesture, make one, commit to it, make the full gesture. If you're like, cause sometimes I find when I'm singing, one thing that happens to me, uh, it used to happen a lot more. I'm a little better about it <laughs> until I got this advice. Um, and I would like, I'm going to raise my arm. I feel like I should raise my arm. Should I raise my, okay, I need to put my arm down. God, my arm's banging up a really long time. Okay, I put it back down. And I have like this little like 10 minute, like, I don't know what, like descent of my arm. Raise your arm if you're going to raise an arm. Say what you're saying with your arm and then put your arm down. So make the gesture, commit to the gesture and complete the gesture. Anything that you do, whether it's a facial expression or maybe you're going to surprise them with a new dynamic, you're singing and you get this musical inspiration of, oh my God, okay, I'm going to sing this next note with all the forte that I can muster within reason, with all the forte that I can muster beautifully or emotionally or expressively, and I'm going to just get them with this note. Then do it. Get them with that note. Absolutely commit. Commit to every musical choice that you're going to make. Commit to every theatrical gesture that you're going to make. And that's going to impress them because it's going to show a really confident artist. And a confident artist is an artist that people in the audience are going to want to watch. So if you can get feedback, if you can um, either write to them, sometimes they just give it to you kind of whether you ask for it or not. <laughs> they give you their feedback from the judges. And it's very important to sit and listen to those things very carefully, specifically what they tell you. Because you may be getting completely different advice. And that can be scary. Um, if you're getting very polarized advice, then take whatever feels right and leave the rest. But if you keep getting the same comment over and over, if you keep being told if, you know, three or four different judges or all the judges or half the judges said, well, you know, your intonation really needs work or, oh, well, you know, your Italian really needs work. Don't ignore that. Take that very seriously. And there are certain comments like those, like objective comments that you must listen to and that you must try to work on because these people are, have no interest in trying to hurt your feelings. 
I hope. <laughs> um, they're there to try and tell you what it was specifically that kept you from winning a prize or what they liked about your performance, what they thought maybe you could work on. And this is the time to work on it and get that true feedback. Um, so if they say, you know, your intonation needs work or your acting needs work or you're, you know, you're, um, you're overweight, because they'll tell you that. Or if they say, oh, you know, I don't think this is the right repertoire for you. Right repertoire for you is more subjective than them literally saying you're overweight, your intonation needs work and your Italian needs work. Right repertoire, they might be right. They might not necessarily be right. But if more than one person says, I don't think you're singing the right stuff, then do take that to heart. But do you see my different, the difference between an objective comment and a subjective comment? It's just something to take to, to just ponder on. Um, so you have to kind of listen to your heart about what's really right for you. Repertoire wise, I firmly believe that, but I also believe if more than one person is telling you, Hey, back off or whatever, it sounds bad because of this, or it's, it's too early or whatever, then listen, when you get out of school and you're trying to figure out what to do next, if you end up going into a young artist program or a fest contract or whatever it is, all of those things ideally will open up a path for you to find management, which is the one thing that I think a lot of people uh, struggle with the most, the step then after the young artist program and the competition. Okay, now what? Now I need to find a manager. Generally, if you've done a young artist program, managers already know who you are. If you're in a young artist program, all managers know who those people are in the United States at least. Uh, and within Europe too, they know the young artists because they talk about them. Because this, whatever the young artists do, whatever you do in your little opera, it travels upstairs. And the management talks about it. And the management hears about it. So don't go to be a young artist and be a crappy young artist. If you are being judged every moment that you're there, there's a little bit like a camera in, in every room um, with everything that you're doing and not doing. If you're showing up late, if you're showing up unprepared, if you're acting sloppy, if you're disrespectful, if you don't learn your music, all of those things, they will find out about that. So don't think that being in a young artist program, you're totally safe. You're not safe from the management of the company and they will find out about you. So I sound like I'm threatening people, but it's the truth. Um, it's a very good, important time to start behaving like a professional and less like a student. Um, if you're not doing a young artist program and you're doing a fest contract, then absolutely everybody will know about you because you'll probably be singing roles on the stage. Uh, in which case, you know, managers come to performances. Managers come to everything, good managers especially, because they're there to represent their artists, but they're also there to listen to what, what else is out there. So, um, and competitions as well, you know, major competitions, Almost always, you know, the people in the business, it's a very small business. And the odds of you singing a few competitions here and there and singing, you know, and auditioning for a young artist program and then nobody knowing who you are are very, very, very slim to zero. Everybody will know who you are just when you start doing the circuit. Um, so the question is, if a manager doesn't approach you, there are managers who don't approach singers. There really are. In fact, I think a lot of them don't try to come and sell themselves to a singer. Um, and that's okay. Not all managers are going to do that for you. And don't freak out if nobody's courting you or coming after you. And you're absolutely within your, you know, I think within your rights, within your, you know, your choice. It's your choice if you want to email uh, a management company and send them your, your materials, your credentials or whatever. Your a recording of you singing, you know, a link to your website. Um, and this is why it's very important to build your own uh, portfolio, if you will, uh, online as well as, you know, have a nice headshot so that you have something that is a good representation of how you really look. Um, it's one of the things you kind of have to prepare on your own as your press package. Um, so if you can compile whenever you're kind of looking for management, if, you, if you've done some productions or some performances and you have some reviews or you have some um, posts about you or newspaper articles, anything you can compile of um, your best work is something that you're going to want to keep and hang on to, to hand out, you know, to, to send to a, a management company or to send to a particular agent that you're interested in. Um, the other thing to really do before you start looking for agents is to research a little bit, you know, look up different agents, see who they represent. How many singers do they have on their roster? How many singers like you do they have on their roster? Is this an agent that is juggling a lot of singers already? Or is this an agent that only really has a, a very few? Um, and if they do have a lot, a lot, a lot of singers, how are their careers? Um, you know, are these singers that are much further along in their careers or are these singers that are still kind of starting out? Most singers will start out with an agent 
for a while and then change at some point in their career because almost nobody really stays at the same agent forever. Some people do, lots of people do. If you're lucky, awesome, that's great. I would have loved to stay with my very first agent, but it didn't work out that way. It just my, they changed their company and the companies are changing all the time. Um, there's always musical chairs um, about companies, you know, shrinking and, and managers leaving companies and starting their own agencies and da 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 da. It happens a lot. So nothing is really established. And whatever the rumors were 10 years ago are different than the rumors today um, about whatever company. So do some research and read up on who's who and what's what, you know, and how their artists are working and if their artists are working. If you can, maybe you know a few of them. Reach out and ask them and say, hey, you know, I see that you're with so-and-so. Do you, are you enjoying working with them? What are they like? Um, and then if you're interested in that agent, you feel like that person is, is good for you, you know, write to them and see if they'll, if they'll respond. Um, not all agents like being written to, but I don't think agents can avoid it. I mean, that's just something that they know and they deal with on a regular basis. So whatever you're going to write to them, don't sit there and try to sell yourself to them and say what a great singer you are. You don't need to say that, but it's important that you have something to present to them, a cookie. Um, this is why you need to very much work on tailoring what's available about you on the internet. Your YouTube videos, if possible, any videos of you singing, videos of you um, performing you know, at a competition, or videos of you just coaching with a pianist. Even if you can just sit down with a pianist you know, and just take a video or make a recording of you performing some arias, whatever, and put those on YouTube or put them on your website. Um, that material is extremely important because agents do look singers up that way. Companies look singers up that way to see how they sound. Um, so if what, put all you can put out there of your best stuff and curate it carefully. Same thing with your social media, you know, curate your social media in a way that looks professional and in a way that looks honest and in a way that looks, um, positive, you know, don't, if your social media is full of angry articles and your social media is full of angry pictures or, or things that are controversial or things that are ugly or whatever, um, I would recommend taking all that stuff down, to be honest with you, because I have heard a lot of stories about singers losing jobs because of stuff that happened on social media. So be very careful about what you put out there. We live in a world now where social media is first and foremost, and everything you say and do is out there. So you're not going to hide from agents or from companies or from teachers or other singers or whatever unless you literally stay off of it and you can't stay off of it because you really need it. <laughs> it's actually really helpful. So a lot of that stuff kind of covers the first steps and your first forays kind of into the business. Now let's talk about a few things that you're going to encounter when you're already working. Um, there are some great things that you're going to, of course, encounter. You're going to encounter, hopefully, a positive feedback, um, a lot of compliments and praise. People will reach out to you and all those beautiful things you get to travel. Um, you will get to be independent as far as your scheduling is concerned. Um, once, you know, those are kind of the wonderful things that start happening. You really start feeling like you can take care of your own time. Uh, you have a lot more days free if you choose or not. Um, and a lot of things about the business are very, very beautiful. I mean, I'm super grateful every day that I get to wake up and do this because this is what I love and this is what I want. Um, there are, of course, harder things to deal with. Um, and sometimes um, they kind of are part of a double-edged sword. But in general, for every great production you do and every great experience you have, you're gonna have a negative one. <laughs> one that's gonna be hard, difficult for you, whether that's because you're, uh, the music is super challenging and you feel like you're um, working really hard vocally. Um, sometimes when you're doing something for the first time, it can be really scary. Sometimes you're gonna be doing a production that's gonna ask a lot of you on stage physically um, or musically. You might be with a conductor that's extremely challenging for you. Uh, you might be with colleagues that aren't specifically um, super supportive of you. You know, you might be in a situation where nobody's really friendly. You might be the only American. All those things um, might happen. And then they might kind of be food for you feeling not so fun, not so great. Um, the best way to deal with whenever you come across negative experiences, I have found, is to come home and let it all out to somebody, but then go back to work the next day and start fresh. Um, <laughs> So find somebody <laughs> to talk to <laughs> because uh, if you bottle it in and swallow it and hold on to it, uh, it might come out 
at the wrong time. I don't know if you're that kind of person. I'm certainly the kind of person that I don't like to hold things in, negative things in, and just let them percolate. And then just, I'm not, and I'm also not the type of person to brush things off. Some people just brush things off and don't worry about them and don't hash. If you're one of those people, congratulations. I wish I could be like you. Um, but if you're the kind of person that analyzes everything and rethinks everything and hashes through everything and goes, oh my God, you know, and starts to break everything down into pieces, do it. Do it when you get home. Do it in a safe place with your mom or your boyfriend or a good friend, a good friend who, who will keep their mouth shut. Uh, don't do it on the internet. That's going to be like stamped there forever. That's why I don't think you should do it because if it's a passing emotion, it will pass and you'll get over it. And then, but you'll always have that mark online. But if you don't have that, if you, if you don't put that online, you know, it's less permanent. It's, it's a passing emotion that will eventually go away. So that's why I feel like, um, if you're going to find somebody to talk to that's safe and then go back to work and try to start fresh every day. Try to start with a positive outlook. Try to fix what it is that you can control because I think one of the things we come across a lot is we get into this, we can't control everything little conundrum because you can't, you can't control the offers that come your way. You can't control who gets, who gets what roles, casting choices, um, you can't control what, sometimes what cast you're in or what director you get to work with. You don't get to control any of that. You get to control very, very, very little. You can only say yes or no. And then once you've said yes and you're there and you're in the engagement, you have to bring the best of yourself, but that's all you can control. So with that in mind, just know that you have to take that responsibility for every single thing that comes out of your mouth, both singing and not singing and every single choice that you make you have to take responsibility for. So be very careful about where you direct your energies and where you direct your expressions, what you're going to express every moment, because the business is extremely small, extremely small. If you become a problem in one house, you might become a problem in 10 houses and you don't want that for yourself. So sometimes the advice fake it till you make it, is helpful because you might have to fake something in the sense that, you know, you might have to just do a production that you don't like. You might have to just sing something in a way that you don't like. You might have to work with a conductor that you don't like. And that doesn't matter. We're here to bring forth the collaboration to the audience, not to sit here and have an ego battle. Um, and as artists, we have big egos, a lot of us and big personalities, a lot of us. Um, and it's very hard to balance that in a practice room, you know? So there are going to be practice rooms that are totally Zen and chill and everyone's wonderful and everyone's sweet and you guys are friends and everything's great. Most of my experiences honestly have been that have been super positive, super friendly, super wonderful. And I certainly do not try to ever be the problem when I go somewhere. Um, but then there are situations that are beyond control and that are beyond being able to be handled. Sometimes there are things that happen that are totally unexpected. There are things, you know, emotions get very, very high. All that stuff does happen. So, um, if you're in a situation where, and I did get some questions about this, what if you're in a situation where the director wants you to do something you don't like, you can either try it and do your best with it. Maybe try to talk to the director about modifying it so that it does suit you. If it's something physical that you just don't feel comfortable with doing, but if it's an artistic choice that this director has made for their production, sometimes you just have to figure out a way to make it work for you. Whether you like it or not, doesn't matter. Just sing it as well as you can and sell that because if you're up there doing a production, you're not enjoying and you're not hundred percent in it. The audience isn't going to enjoy it either. And if the audience doesn't enjoy the show, and doesn't enjoy the whole thing. It's going to not be this big a success and you want to have a success because you're part of the show. So you want to try and make the most positive things out of your performance. You want to try and create the best out of your own performance. So, um, I always try everything once that every director tells me I really do. Even music directors, if they want something specific, a dynamic or something musical, they want me to try. I always try it. Sometimes I think, Oh God, I hate that idea, but I try it anyway. And sometimes I end up changing my mind and saying, oh, that's great. It's the best thing I've ever done. I'm going to do that every time <laughs> until I get to somebody else who changes it, you know? Um, and you will have to make a lot of changes. That's why I said in my first video, prepared, but neutral, be prepared with your ideas and your interpretation and your, what you want to do, but be neutral because you will be asked to change it. 
a lot of it. And you have to just deal with that. Don't take it personally. Just know that this is their production. The conductor is doing their thing. They have to manage an orchestra. It's not all about you. You have to just make adjustments. You have to be malleable. And you have, people have to be able to work with you. If people can't work with you, they're not going to want to ask for you ever again. And they're not. They're going to report at the end of the production to the staff, this person was hard to work with. And then you've just burnt a bridge. And you don't want to do that. It's not worth it. Even if you're a great singer, you don't want to do that. Ideally, you want to have as many opportunities as possible for yourself. So don't lose opportunities by not controlling your behavior. So... Um, the last thing I want to talk about is rejection and criticism. I'm going to kind of bulk that together because we do get a lot of that. We do get a lot of feedback uh, and we certainly get a lot of the answer no <laughs> sometimes. Um, if you are really wanting to be a singer more than anything else in this world and you're making every single effort possible to try and be one, you're working on your voice, you're working on your health, you're working on your music, you're working on your languages, and you're doing everything right, or you think you are. And the answer is still no, 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 no. Try and find out why. Because there's almost always a reason. There really is. People don't just say no for nothing. People say no for a reason. And if you can find out what that reason is, do. If it's something you can change and you can work on, then do that if you really want to do it, if you really want to be out there. If you're just not getting opportunities because you're not getting opportunities because you're not in a place where you can get opportunities, then you have to figure out a way to get to a place where you can get some opportunities. If that means moving out of the small town that you live in that doesn't have an opera company or that doesn't have any teachers or that doesn't have anything available, then that's what you have to do. It's unfortunate because that means in a lot of ways that people with less economic means have fewer opportunities. And that is very true in a lot of cases. And it isn't right. But that's why you have to do competitions. And that's why you have to do things that will hopefully win you some money with your talent. Um, I had nothing when I started. Nothing. I moved to New York with the money that I won in the Met competition. And I lived in a basement, living on my young artist's salary, which was very, very little. And I lived out in Queens. I mean, in New York, it's very, very little. It doesn't go very far. Uh, and you will find that the big cities are very expensive. But if you can get help when you're a student, you know, if you can get a scholarship, if you can do NATS, if you can do whatever, find a way when you're younger to start managing your money and start saving your money so that you can use it later to start your career, so that you can get yourself where you need to be. Um, don't let money be what holds you back. A lot of times it will be and there's not anything you can do about it. And unfortunately, that's the sad truth of life. There are people who are going to have more money. It's just going to be easier for them to just move to New York and just, you know, send, get really fabulous pictures taken and have really nice dresses and have really nice, you know, transportation and get flights wherever they want and, you know, stay in nicer hotels. And yes, that's absolutely true. And that doesn't end. Even it starts at the beginning and it's that way for the whole career. There are people who will make a lot of money and there are people who aren't going to make as much money. Um, but we don't do it for the money. We do it because we love it. So if money is something I firmly believe anybody can save, even if you're making very, very little, if you're having to work side jobs, if you're having to teach on the side, if you're working church jobs, because most of, most of us do that, save that money, put it away, live with a roommate, you know, live with your parents, God forbid, uh, you know, find a, a church friend, a wealthy church friend, you know, um, that's willing to help you, you know, um, sometimes people generally, I found at least in, when I was in college that, you know, the, the people who were a little wealthier, they wanted to help us and they reached out to us as young, uh, as young students and offered their help, you know, so accept it, you know, take, take that help when you're young, if you can, you know, if, um, if that's, a, if that's one of the issues that you struggle with, the best thing you can do though, is work on the things that are your own, that you can control that don't cost anything practicing, putting your, investing your time, investing your, your energy and your effort into working on the things that I talked about in the first video. Um, so I hope that all of that is helpful. I hope that you guys can kind of see a bit more with a bit more clarity. You know, there is a lot more to the business, of course, than meets the eye. You know, it's not glamorous all the time. Um, but it can be very, very rewarding and it is worth it. 
I firmly believe that. I love it. I love my job. I love what I do. I'm super happy. I feel like this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm very, very, very lucky that I can do this for a living. Uh, and I want to do it as long as I can. I really do. That's why I'm passing on this stuff. Because the things that I have found that have worked for me, that have made my life better, that have enhanced my life as an artist and as a human being, I want to share those things. Because I want other people to have this experience. Because there's room for all of us. There really, really is. If this is something you really want and it's something you really have a gift and you're really ready, willing and ready to work on it and put forth the effort that it takes to do it, there is room for you on the stage. There really is. Take care.